Good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, John Chipman, and I am the Director General and Chief Executive of the International Institute for Strategic Studies. It is my very great pleasure to welcome you to this year's first Sea Lord Sea Power Conference, which we are hosting in association with the United Kingdom uh, Naval Staff. And we're also extremely grateful for the support for this event that we have received from BAE Systems and Rolls-Royce. And let me immediately thank also here at the IISS, Nick Childs, our Senior Fellow for Naval Forces and Maritime Security for his sterling work with the Navy to organize this day long event. The IISS, as most of you all know, is international in its composition, perspective and reach, but has a strong UK pedigree and strategic outlook. We have grown from a small organization analyzing nuclear power and arms control to a global institute examining all aspects of geopolitical and geoeconomic change. Our headquarters is here in Arundel House on Temple Place, but we have offices in Manama at the Bahrain Financial Harbor, in Singapore in Republic Plaza, in Washington on K Street, and as from next month in Berlin in Paris Platz. So a nicely elegant address list even to the most demanding of international commercial real estate agents. We have long been uh, famous for the IISS military balance, which grew from a 17 page pamphlet listing the armed forces of the NATO and Warsaw Pact countries to an enormous database covering all military domains in more than 173 countries, including data on everything from military exercises to defense economics. We're active in defense diplomacy, an important goal of the defense command paper the UK recently issued. Ever since 2004, we have convened the national security establishments of the Middle East with key outside powers at our IISS Manama Dialogue in Bahrain. And indeed, it was at the 2014 Manama Dialogue that Michael Fallon and Philip Hammond signed the Naval Facilities Agreement uh, with Bahrain. The Shangri-La Dialogue, which we've held since 2002 in Singapore, increasingly has the maritime domain at the center of its deliberations. And recently, we have heard a lot at that summit on the need to maintain a so-called free and open Indo-Pacific. In both the Middle East and Asia, as well as in the other areas on which we focus, the maritime domain is always at the center of defense minister's concerns. And hence, our pleasure in examining how this otherwise benign thoroughfare has become an ever more contested space and one in which the UK should play its role both in defense of national interests and in support of that international public good of free and open waterways. So over the course of the day, we will be debating the shape of the maritime domain in an age of evolving and intensifying competition, the challenges and opportunities represented by rapid technological change, the economic dimensions of maritime power and the value of power presence and partnerships in the maritime domain in the context of global Britain and the ambitions for a globally deployed Royal Navy. A few rules of engagement. We will have two keynote addresses and a special message this morning followed by a Q&A session all on the record. When we get to the Q&A session, those seeking the floor can use the hand function over Zoom or send me a query over the chat function. Now the Right Honorable Ben Wallace, Secretary of State for Defense, who is a long pedigree also in defense, having served in the armed forces, being the UK's longest serving security minister uh, before assuming the role of Secretary of State for Defense is our first keynote speaker today. We are delighted that he will deliver the keynote address here and in doing so take the opportunity to pay tribute to a great uh, British Admiral in a recently established tradition for defense secretaries by delivering uh, the Sir Henry Leach lecture. And I believe that Henrietta, his daughter, is with us virtually today. It is in honor of Admiral of the Fleet, Sir Henry Leach, who was the first Sea Lord and Chief of Naval Staff at the time of the 1982 Falklands conflict. And he was instrumental, of course, in the dispatch of the Royal Navy Task Force uh, to the South Atlantic. So with that uh, preface, Ben Wallace, that podium and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, John, and thank you to IISS uh, for uh, inviting me. And it's a privilege to be here after six decades. I think you have been, uh, for the past six decades, shaped the strategic agenda and continues to inform our understanding of the defence trends that define our world. I certainly find your reports incredibly useful, uh, and uh, I think it's important that we have external uh, views more often into our defence. It's an honour to give a speech in memory of Sir Henry Leach, who in the midst of the Falklands crisis 
became Margaret, Mrs. Thatcher's knight in shining gold braid. And I'm delighted that his daughter, Henrietta Wood, is able to join us today. For those like me who experienced the Falklands War as a backdrop to their childhood and a, a school near Yeovilton as the a war broke out. I remember the fathers of many of my fellow school children going off to fight in that war. It's hard to believe that next year will mark the 40th anniversary of that conflict. Much has changed since then. But one thing has not. As in Leech's day, our senior service continues to be held in the highest regard. Look at your achievements over the past year, First Sea Lords. You've not just given vital support during COVID evacuating citizens, supporting testing and delivering vaccines. But you've braved rough seas to liberate hijacked tankers in the Solent. You were first on the scene in Beirut after that terrible explosion, and you delivered vital humanitarian aid when hurricanes ravaged Honduras. Our Navy remains British great Britain's greatest ambassador, a fact only underlined by an event that took place 80 years ago on board HMS Prince of Wales, a ship commanded incidentally by Henry Leach's father, because it was on those decks that President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill met to agree the Atlantic Charter, a document that would reshape the post-world order. Today, that order is increasingly under threat. Russian activity is at its highest in the North Sea for 30 years. Iran continues its destabilizing activity in the Straits of Hormuz, and piracy is increasing in the Gulf of Guinea. The risk to our trade, to our undersea cables, to our stability is rising. So we must continue to stand up for our values and rights wherever they come under threat, not just in our own backyard, but far from the shores. For me, a prescient piece of wisdom contained in Leach's memoirs sums up the approach we're talking about and we are going to take. Writing of the future of the service, he says, effective deterrence involves maintaining a high state of readiness, being well equipped, trained and operating and deploying wherever and whenever the situation demands. I couldn't agree more, and we're sticking to Leach's script. Take readiness. I made it clear to the first Sea Lord that I had one overriding priority for the Navy, which was to get what he's got working. When it comes to being well equipped, the Prime Minister and I are ensuring our Navy has world class kit to stay at the cutting edge. Our integrated review and defence command paper, coupled with £24 billion boost to our defence budget, guarantees the UK will remain the foremost naval power in Europe. And over the life of this parliament, we are doubling shipbuilding investment to over 1.7 billion pounds a year. Our shipbuilding pipeline won't just be producing eight type 26 anti-submarine warfare frigates on the Clyde and five type 31 general purpose frigates in the side. It will also give us three fleet solid support ships, as well as a multi-royal ocean surveillance cap capability in order to protect our critical undersea cables. There will be type 32 frigates to provide persistent presence overseas and sophisticated overseas patrol vessels, our greenest ships yet, to protect our territorial waters. Multi-royal support ships will deliver literal strike while autonomous mine hunters will remove risk to life and limb. And not only will we have next generation of dreadnought submarines to provide our strategic nuclear deterrent, but we will have our mighty carriers projecting our strategic conventional deterrent as well. In 1982, Leach could call on Invincible and Hermes to provide invaluable air cover for the vulnerable task force, which was 8,000 miles away from home. In 2021, we are able now to draw on HMS Queen Elizabeth and HMS Prince of Wales. But there the similarity ends. Weighing in at 65,000 tons each, these are the most powerful surface fleets ever constructed in Britain. Floating pieces of sovereign territory that can sail over 70% of the world's surface and they give our government unprecedented options to act independently against hostile forces on land or at sea for months on end without having access to bases ashore. If proof were needed that ours is a fleet that can operate as Sir Henry wished, wherever, whenever the situation demands, we have only to point to HMS Queen Elizabeth's upcoming schedule. In less than 10 days time, she will be leading our carrier strike group on her maiden mission. Over 28 weeks, she will be traveling over 26,000 nautical miles from the Mediterranean to the Philippine Sea. On the flight deck, she'll host the largest group of fifth generation fighters ever put to sea. Not to mention the greatest quantity of helicopters assigned to a single task group in a decade. While below deck, a company of 4-2 Commando Royal Marines will be embarked ready for action. The carrier's departure marks the decisive shift in posture heralded by our integrated review and command paper 
It signals that in future, Britain won't just be more engaged, but permanently deployed. Already, this change is underway. Alongside a maritime component command in Bahrain, we have ships permanently stationed across the world, from HMS Montrose in the Gulf and HMS Medway in the Caribbean to HMS Trent in Gibraltar and HMS Forth in the South Atlantic. Today, our crews rotate, but our ships stay there as well. Meanwhile, our transformed future commando force will be primed and persistently forward deployed, ever ready to strike where others cannot. And they'll be backed up by two littoral response groups, one in the North Atlantic and one in the Indo-Pacific, giving us the capacity to respond to emerging crisis in a matter of hours, not weeks. 80 years on from the signing of the Atlantic Charter, we are not just showing our commitment to strengthening the international system. We are strengthening those partnerships that shore up our rules-based order. So this mission will be an opportunity to take integration with our great US partners to a new level. With the Arleigh Burke class destroyer USS the Sullivans providing the strike group with air defense and anti-submarine capabilities, and a squadron of 10 US Marine Corps F-35B Lightning II aircraft, the Wake Island Avengers, flying side by side with their US counterparts. It will be an opportunity to increase our integration from our long-term, long-time maritime allies, the Netherlands. And by visiting over 40 countries and undertaking over 70 engagements, this mission will be an opportunity to bolster alliances with a multitude of air and maritime forces, ranging from the Mediterranean to the Gulf to the South Pacific. Yet our carrier is more than just a warship, more even than a platform for partnership. It's a floating showcase for British shipbuilding talent. Built in six iconic yards, Appledore, Birkenhead, Govan, Portsmouth, Recife and Tyne, assembled by a cast of more than 10,000 and some 8,000 apprentices, drawing on the niche capability of hundreds of small companies, 90% from the United Kingdom. This is British engineering at its best. But as shipbuildings are, I've been very clear, guaranteeing, guaranteeing the sustainability of our future fleet means strengthening the resilience of British shipbuilding. So this summer, I'll be refreshing our national shipbuilding strategy. It will say we're no longer primarily focused on hulls, but on looking right across the shipbuilding enterprise from naval and commercial shipbuilding to systems and subsystems. It will say, send a much clearer demand signal about what we're trying to achieve with our procurement programs. For the first time, releasing a 30 year pipeline for all government vessel procurement over 150 tons. And it will work seamlessly with central, local and devolved governments, as well as industry and academia to realize our aspirations. I want to supercharge British shipbuilding right across our great union increasing the productivity of our great yards, strengthening local manufacturers and the supply chain, blazing a trail in technology and environmental innovation, and not just driving up global competitiveness, but energizing our skills base, so that the ships that leave these shores aren't simply famed for bearing the label made in Britain, but for a stamp that says Belfast or Birkenhead. It's worth reminding ourselves of what Sir Henry said to the Iron Lady after she asked if she, we could recapture the Falklands. Yes, we could, and in my judgment, we should, because if we do not, or if we pussyfoot in our actions and do not achieve complete success, in another few months, we shall be living in a different country whose word counts for little. We live in a more anxious and insecure time, but today, as Leach hoped for, British sea power is resurgent. Our crews are active, our vessels are globally present. Our great carrier is ready to go, so Henry can be reassured. Our word still counts across the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have time for a conversation with the uh, Secretary of State for Defense. I'm technologically advised that we have slightly over 300 people uh, who are in attendance um, at this uh, important uh, First Sea Lord Sea Power Conference. So I would invite anyone who wants to take the floor to uh, put up their hand or send me a note over the chat function. If not, uh, first Nick Childs um, from the IISS, please. Thank you, John, and <clears throat> thank you very much, Secretary of State, for your remarks. Um, I'd like to um, pick up the context of um, a, a globally deployed Navy, but also the context in the integrated review of the uh, uh, different uh, uh, focuses and uh, priorities as far as, as, far as uh, the, the UK's defence and security is concerned. And uh, we've heard a lot about the, um, the Indo-Pacific tilt. Uh, but we've also heard that uh, the uh, European commitment, as far as the UK is concerned, is un unimpeachable. 
Um, how are you going to shape those priorities, even with a growing Navy that you talk about? The resources are still limited, and there will be a sense still, I think, among some, some people look at, looking at this, that it doesn't quite add up still. Um, thank you. Well, look, I think, first of all, um, when, we, when we talk about, for example, the Indo-Pacific tilt, it is not just a military tilt. It is, you know, um, playing to our strengths across a whole horizon, economic, science, culture, uh, defense is obviously, and security is part of it, industrial, uh, and all of that means that I think we need a more intelligent application of Britain's uh, capabilities to uh, Indo-Pacific uh, region, and I think that's what I would say. So it's not... Uh, you know, entirely predicated on purely a big defense move. I think it's secondly, uh, people have been a bit too literal in considering that you can compete, for example, with China by having to go to their backyard. You know, you don't have to go very far uh, to compete with China or indeed to be challenged by Russian aggression. You, you can simply go to Africa if you want to see British firms competing sometimes at a disadvantage against a, a, a more uh, assertive China. And so you don't have to go very far to, 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 you know, to do that. So I think that's also something that we should recognize. Um, how we apply our forces, I think, is where we can magnify and benefit from the difference between the likes of China and Russia. You know, there's something really uh, that stands out about, for example, Russia, because they don't have any friends. You know, we have friends. I mean, our fundamental strength across the world is our alliances, whether that's the Five Powers Defense Agreement, which will be 50 years old this year, uh, whether that's NATO, whether that's you know, G7, whatever. We have friends and allies, uh, and that's the same in the Pacific. Um, and that's how we're going to uh, force multiply. That's how we're going to achieve the effect uh, we do so. And, and what's been telling is that the dawn of China on the United States is that the United States is, is coming across a power that it unilaterally can't challenge. You know, and, and it's a really interesting thing when you go to the United States to see, see that in lawmakers and, and policymakers, that, that realization that it is going to be alliances that is going to further their ambitions. It's not uh, going to be able to be done on your own. You know, no longer will you be the biggest surface fleet in the world, potentially. So I think that's how we do it. Thank you very much. We've got a few questions uh, in the um, chat function here. Um, the inevitable question about the carrier's 28 week deployment from Larissa. Uh, Brown of the Times. Could the Secretary of State confirm the carrier will go into the South China Sea? Why is this necessary? Is he concerned about China's reaction? Uh, well, we are going to Japan. We're going to visit our friend and ally in Japan, and uh, we will take a range of routes to get there, but um, I'm confident we'll be going to the East China Sea, South China Sea, Philippine Sea. We'll be going there. We've got some exercising to do with the United States as well. I think that's in the Philippine Sea. Uh, and we're going because... Japan is a like-minded, shares the same value ally around the world. It is challenged often by a number of countries. Uh, the freedom of navigation is, is constantly under challenge around the world, and I think uh, it's the right thing to do. But we are, we are going in a confident manner, uh, but we're not going in a confrontational manner. And um, from Thomas McPhail, with the US pivot to Asia and the need for Europe to take responsibility for its own security, isn't there a need for further security and defense cooperation between, in particular, the UK, France, and Germany, including especially on operations? Yes, I mean, we, it's why we set up the CGEF for greater work with the, the combined joint expeditionary force with the French, and we've done quite a lot of work. We exercised, I think, a naval exercise last year uh, with the French. Uh, we've also set up, uh, as the framework nation, something called the JEF, the Joint Expeditionary Force, which is both Scandinavian and Nordic countries, which is interesting because within that is obviously Finland and Sweden, uh, and Germany sits alongside in the Northern group, which is another grouping. So we, we you know, I, I, I think the future in diplomacy and, and what I haven't brought out in the speech today is that part of our command paper is a significant investment in defense diplomacy. Um, you know, we, we've got to, it, that point about more intelligently applying our use of presence needs a proper network of defense engagement around the world, a, a better quality defense network. We're going to improve both the quality and the training of our diplomats around the world, defense diplomats. Um, but, it, but those sort of things are uh, really important. And you know, I think the future is, yes, the traditional alliances, but, 
bilateral, trilateral alliances on a range of issues where you have common cause, uh, I think means you have to work at that like you've never worked before. But I think there is really opportunity there to do it. And that's how, you know, when the United States completes its pivot or what it actually means in force levels in Europe and Africa and elsewhere, that's where we all set about dealing with issues that, that raise threats to us that maybe we come along and join together. So in France and Mali, you know, it, 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 the direct threat to the United Kingdom from, from Islamist terrorists in Mali is minimal, but there is a UN concern there, which is why we're in there with the UN. And there's obviously a direct French concern because their security is directly under threat. And that's why we support them as Chinooks. Thank you very much. And um, a good friend of the Navy and Parliament, um, Tobias Elwood, I think uh, you're on now. Tobias. Uh, Secretary of State, good to uh, see you. Thank you for your time today. Great to see the aircraft carrier uh, finally out uh, as, a, as a carrier group. Could you explain a bit more about the Type 32? Because force presence, upstream engagement is so critical. And I think a big question that this conference may focus on is the size of the Navy itself. Will we see a more modular type of design in the Type 32, perhaps more of them, so we can have increased presence, but more bespoke capabilities on each individual Type 32, depending on the actual commitment, the tasking at hand? Thank you. Well, look, um, on the Type 32, I think details of what that will be uh, and it's sort of uh, the spec we will require is being worked through right now. Uh, I think it's partly about answering your part of your question, which is we need more hulls. That's true. And the Type 32 commitment will be about that. Um, it will come after the Type 31. So we've got quite a bit of time uh, to work through the system, what we actually want it to do. Uh, but it will have at its heart this ability to be more productive. Um, you know, the, 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 we often have this debate about, you know, how many hulls do you have? And from where I sit at my desk, what's really important is how much availability I have. You know, there is simply no point in having lots of hulls if they're not at sea. Uh, I know only one a hull can only be at one place at a time, so I, I'm not I'm not you know ignorant that hulls matter, but but availability matters, and I think we should be really striving for better availability of our fleet. Uh, you, you know, Tobias and I do. It sort of breaks your heart when you go to Portsmouth and you used to see those Type 45s all tied up. You know, you you could. You could boast on top trumps we could you know that we've got six type 45s but actually we only had one and a half at some stages and that's frankly not good enough which is why we're doing the propulsion improvement program so look i i think what we can identify is we want our ships to be more productive uh, more able to be persistent uh, and available uh, than they've been before uh, and i think more versatile i think you're right uh, having ships that aren't anchored to one particular type of either weapon system uh, is not a, a cost-effective way. We need more modularity uh, and more flexibility. If you look at the Russians and how they use some, even some of the most basic ships to put uh, ship containers with missiles on board, you know that type of thing makes them suddenly quite a threat to people. So we have to we have to look at what's going on around the world as well. And I think if we can do that, I think we'll get a, a, a continue to get a spiky navy, more available uh, and more numbers. But uh, the Type 32 has got a few years to run, uh, but we'll definitely keep you all informed. Secretary said, I mentioned we have um, uh, an office in Singapore, and this question comes from uh, Singapore from our senior fellow, Lynn Kwok. Uh, Lynn asks, you talked about the UK's friends. There's also been talk about an alliance of democracies, the D10, and much talk about values in the integrated review. Do you think that this focus on democracy helps or hurts the UK's ability to make friends in the Indo-Pacific, where some important strategic players, for example, Vietnam, are not liberal democracies or even electoral democracies. I don't. Th I don't think it hinders us. I think you know that is our values. We believe in democracy and uh, you know uh, rule of law and and the regard for human rights. I mean that is that's what we believe in. We're not going to hide that under a bushel. Um, but it doesn't mean to say uh, that is entirely exclusive from also the belief in a sort of sense of fair play. You know, um, uh, you know, Vietnam has been under significant pressure from China, uh, and I think. You know, publicly, Britain has called out China on a range of issues, including intellectual property theft or cyber crimes. You know, at its heart, Britain believes in fair play. We do believe in, you know, these are the rules. You, you respect each other. I think the start point in the Asia Pacific is to respect each other, respect each other's sea, uh, respect each other's territorial walk waters. Uh, and, you know, 
standing up for that is, is not a bad start. Um, so I don't think it hinders us at all. I mean, we are what we are, We're, and I'm proud of it. And from St. Anthony's College, Oxford, Renee uh, Balletta uh, asks, what is the UK government's actual priority in the Indo-Pacific? Reinforcing peace and security or developing UK prosperity? One seeks to upset China, the other to befriend. Can we do both? Uh, well, I think prosperity is important uh, uh, for, obviously for Britain, but also for many of those countries in the region. And I think uh, uh, Britain, it's in Britain's interest to have trade deals with many, many of those countries. Uh, it's in Britain's interest to trade and have choice. Um, you know, what, one of the tensions, uh, I think, uh, between the United States and China would be the lack of diversity in supply chain. Uh, and that sets up a tension. And no customer wants to only have to buy from one uh, supplier. That, that, that applies to us in running our own household. So uh, I think fundamentally, uh, prosperity uh, needs to be encouraged. Uh, of course, we can't ignore China. China is very important to our economy. China is a very important uh, player in the world. I think what we do want to say to China is, you know, uh, we have regard for human rights. We want them to uphold the rights in Hong Kong. We want them to respect and uphold rights of their minorities, such as the Uyghur. Uh, and we call them out when that happens. That, that isn't, doesn't mean to say that we can't and we won't be trading with China. But I think we need, going back to think about fair play, we set out our rules and that's what we stand by. Thank you very much. An interesting question here about um, the relationship in effect between uh, geoeconomics and geopolitics from Nick Anderson. How do we best communicate, and you're a politician, how do we best communicate to the British public the payback and economic security and prosperity from expanding the fleet and the increasing deployments? Uh, well, you, you could do it in the most simple terms is that uh, free movement of goods around the world uh, produces cheaper products in your shops. And if that free movement of goods is threatened, uh, you will see an increase in your prices and your shopping basket. Uh, that's pretty much the economic argument. Uh, the political argument is we take for granted freedom of movement of ourselves, going on holiday, going to Singapore for the IISS conference. Uh, we, we take that for granted. Uh, and we shouldn't. One thing I learned as security minister is quite how fragile security is, and you have to work at it. And thirdly, I think when it comes to security and defense, uh, the best way to avoid conflicts is to engage early. Uh, the best way to avoid having to send men and women from Britain off to war is to help prevent conflicts happening by providing resilience to your allies and partners around the world to make sure it doesn't blow up into conflicts. Uh, and that, that is, I think, uh, something that we have to engage earlier in. And I think both the Integrated Review and the Defence Command paper were clear about that. And that's why part of our force is going to be designed to get in the business of resilience, helping those other countries be more secure, more strong and stable, so that uh, you know dark forces don't uh, don't don't weaken them or, or turn them into uh, disaster zones. Many thanks. And from here, the ISS in uh, London, our senior fellow for Chinese Defence Modernisation, Mayor Owens. Thank you very much, John, and thank you very much, Secretary of State. Um, you've mentioned conflicts, but of course, a number of countries in the Indo-Pacific region face challenges in the hybrid, hybrid zone and um, in uh, grey zone warfare. So my question is, how can the UK play a role in assisting its partners and allies push back or um, at least deal uh, with some of these hybrid challenges, whether they be maritime militia or the use of dredging ships uh, and the like? Thank you. I think there's a range of things. First of all, illumination, um, you know, number of powers, including ourselves, the USA, they all have, uh, you know, ISR capability. Um, but I think when you can illuminate things going wrong, when you when you illuminate, I remember quite a telling picture of the uh, Chinese fishing fleet, which turned out to be a rather large fishing fleet, didn't look like what you and I think of as a fishing fleet. Uh, I, th I think illumination of that into the global audience is important and into the UN. Uh, I think uh, if it's cyber, where an awful lot of the sort of gray zone activity goes on, uh, forming partners on cyber, and well, I'm not gonna say which countries we already have partnerships with outside the traditional five eyes, uh, we are strengthening and deepening those cyber partnerships. Uh, you know, one of the things Britain leads the world in is GCHQ and its capabilities. Uh, it's very well respected. 
uh, and you know we have that knowledge to share which is what we do and i think uh, just just getting into the business of resilience it comes back to the resilience word on so many issues helping countries with their own resilience is in both our interests uh, you know helping the banking system when i was security minister i remember going to singapore to talk about uh, illicit money flows and what help can be given there or japan was victim of a very major cyber attack of about four or five years ago emanated from a foreign power uh, that type of resilience is really really important for their economy and and we are there helping them and we will soon set up the national cyber force uh, in a greater scale and that will be able to help as well and uh, the final question before we close this part of the morning session because secretary of state has uh, a commitment um, uh, to which he needs to move from uh, commodore uh, Rowley woods given the west muted response to russian naval activity in the black sea around the sea of azov and kart strait and having effectively ceded the south china sea to china following pla expansionism there shouldn't the posture of the csg deployment be more assertive rather than fo focusing on prosperity over provocation well i, I don't think britain has been uh, quiet on ukraine in fact uh, i think we've got a ship in the black sea as we speak We've had numerous deployments, uh, both alongside the United States or on our own, Type 45s. I myself went to visit the Sea of Asmov myself uh, and saw the captured ships that had been returned from uh, the Russian Navy. Uh, we have Operation Orbital, which is helping the capacity of the Ukrainians and the resilience. Uh, and we'll look at even more methods we can to make sure that Ukraine uh, is protected. Uh, so I think that is, you know, we're pretty active um, and, you know, we are planning a, a large carrier exercise uh, in the Pacific. Uh, there will be three carriers, I think, getting together uh, to do that. Uh, I think if that isn't assertive, I don't know what is. Uh, I think it's a pretty powerful statement of Britain's capability to interoperate with its allies. Uh, and I think it says an awful lot about uh, our capabilities. You know, so I think we are. Um, you know, does it involve certain routes? I, I think if anyone parked three carriers anywhere near the United Kingdom, I would find that an assertive act. Uh, uh, and uh, I think those sort of things uh, speak for themselves. Secretary of State, thank you very much. Um, thank you for delivering this uh, Sir Henry Leach uh, lecture this morning uh, for the strong political commitment you've shown to uh, Britain's defense diplomacy around the world. And I know everyone in this room and certainly the over 300 people who are attending uh, this event over the day are, are very pleased with your and the Prime Minister's commitment uh, to uh, the Royal Navy. Thank you for having this conversation with us. We know that you have to uh, leave for an urgent uh, commitment. No one should overinterpret the, the Secretary of State's departure uh, from this meeting at 10.09 at this morning. He has a 10.10 commitment. Let us thank him again for being with us this morning. Thank you very much, everybody. So we, meet, we move smartly on to our uh, next uh, uh, keynote address uh, from the first Sea Lord, uh, Admiral Tony Radican, that same podium, uh, and the floor is also now yours. Tony. Good morning, John, everyone. Uh, I really am delighted uh, to welcome people to this year's Sea Power Conference. And this year, we've refreshed the format to attract the widest possible participation from service chiefs, academics, opinion formers, and for the first time, our future maritime strategists. And I look forward to the discussion panels which have been arranged for today. We'll, we will explore the potential for global maritime competition and cooperation within our connected but contested world. And most importantly, can I also extend a special welcome to the family of Admiral of the Fleet, Sir Henry Leach, in whose honor we heard that memorial keynote speech. The timing of today's conference is fortuitous. Our government has invested significant amounts of both political and economic capital in defense and champions the transformative effect of the maritime sector. In November, in the House of Commons, the Prime Minister made clear his vision for defense. The era of cutting our defense budget must end and it ends now. Similarly, speaking on the flight deck of HMS Tamar in London in September, our Secretary of State said, the global picture has changed. 
The static concept of war versus peace no longer applies as we are contested on either side of the threshold of armed conflict on a regular basis. Our armed forces must be more forward deployed, deterring Russian activity in Europe, combating terror in the Middle East and the Sahel, and countering Chinese activity in the Asia Pacific. And more importantly, the announcements in the integrated review and the defense command paper have brought defense more sharply into focus in relation to current and emerging geopolitical realities. Our government has signaled a compelling need for modernized, relevant and battle-winning forces. At its heart, the IR has not only reflected the Prime Minister's vision for a global Britain, but also signaled a maritime resurgence and a very welcome renaissance of British shipbuilding. I know this all sounds too gushing and too good to be true. And so I want to unpack what I think lies behind these changes, why it adds up and what it really means for the Royal Navy. The IR was comprehensive and wide ranging. It is about so much more than defense, climate change, strengthening science in a technological age, stepping out beyond the EU and driving economic growth through trade and globalized services. It is about staying strong in the Euro-Atlantic, our dominant role in NATO, staying close to our allies and partners, and a modest yet decisive emphasis on the Indo-Pacific. It also confirmed the critical role and importance of our nuclear deterrent in an uncertain world. The IR returns to a world seen through the lens of classical geopolitics. Mackinder's world island is confronted by Mahan's world ocean. As a maritime democracy, we will be able to exploit our distinctive brand as an outward facing, free trading maritime nation. The IR also offers the opportunity to be bold and innovative so that with our allies and partners, we can deter aggression, resist coercion and protect both the United Kingdom and its interests against all comers. It also reflects the British way of warfare, one that exploits the benefits of being as brave as lions and as cunning as foxes in the use of our people, technologies and ideas. And also the IR addresses the key issue of our time, the likelihood of strategic competition with major states and the possibility of confrontation and conflict with peer and peer plus opponents. We should be clear that the view of some recent commentators who imagined only a succession of small containable conflicts was flawed. The possibility of state on state conflict is back with a vengeance and with challenge. But allied with the intellectual and policy frame, we are also developing concepts and innovative ways in which we can employ our armed forces and people so that they can address these challenges and deliver decisive fighting capability. Our allies and partners have picked up the pace and are seeking to modernize and shape their force structures to enable us to compete and prevail in the most challenging circumstances. Investment will be applied where it is most needed to achieve the strategic and operational outcomes that we require, allowing the right solution at the right time in the right place. This is why there has been a remarkable level of investment in all three armed forces and in those critical enabling dimensions of space and cyber. What has made the difference is that we now have a four-year settlement and additional resources that have enabled all three services and strategic command to be more agile and coherent in our projections of operational capability and acquisition. For once, there is a very real possibility that strategy can balance ends, ways and means and that risk can be contained. As a result, the Ministry of Defence and the service chiefs 
have no excuses not to deliver. The Secretary of State and the Prime Minister can hold us to account and there will be no hiding place. And if I'm honest, that is both welcome and daunting at the same time. The Royal Navy and our people are eagerly embracing this challenge and the opportunities that this provides. We are acquiring a 50% increase in tonnage between 2015 and 2030. This decade alone will see up to eight classes of ships and submarines under construction. These are levels of investment that have not been seen for almost 50 years. And crucially, along with additional and more modern ships, we will have increased availability to the extent that the fleet commander's deployable destroyer and frigate days double between 2020 and 2030. That is phenomenal. And while we're at it, let's kill another myth. We have the people to crew these ships. Recruitment is up, retention is up. We have a thousand more people than we did a year ago. We have a smaller headquarters and fewer admirals. We have shifted 15% of billets from shore to sea. And I'm committed to making the front line the best place to serve. The integrated operating concept as set out by CDS last autumn harnesses the strengths afforded by the maritime with a posture that is more proactive, forward deployed, and has persistent presence around the world. It allows us to exploit the freedom of deployment and maneuver that is provided by the world's primary strategic medium of access and exchange, the sea. Maritime based and projected forces can intervene worldwide at a time and place of political choice without the permission of any other country. Operations with our sister services and our allies will require even greater cooperation, interoperability and flexibility. And Carrier Strike Group 21 is helping to lead the way. You will hear more details shortly from Commodore Steve Morehouse, who commands the Carrier Strike Group. The deployment carries strategic and national significance. A partner nation which embarks and entrusts a squadron of F-35 jets with us on a carrier which flies the NATO flag with partner nation frigates, destroyers, submarines in support. Nine major exercises, multi-carrier operations, over 40 countries to be visited, over 70 port visits, stimulating cooperation and trade, security, asserting the freedom of the seas and worldwide reach, testing and proving new capabilities and possibilities, values, alliances, friends, and shared interests. This is multilateralism on steroids. And we are going to become even more engaged around the world in addition to our usual stomping grounds of the Atlantic, Caribbean, Falklands, Mediterranean, and the Gulf. We already have a littoral response group deployed off Northern Europe, working with our Jeff partners. And by 2023, we will have established a second response group permanently based in the Indian Ocean. More investment is going into nuclear and underwater capabilities where we have, can, and must sustain an advantage. And I foresee that the underwater dimension, the only remaining stealth medium, will become preeminent for hide and seek warfare. Let me also mention our very capable batch two offshore patrol vessels, the greenest warships in the fleet. Already HMS Medway is based in the Caribbean, HMS Fourth in the South Atlantic, HMS Trent is in Gibraltar and about to have the new ships of the Gibraltar squadron. Soon the final two, HMS Tamar and HMS Spey, will head west about into the Indo-Pacific and join up with the carrier strike group the long way around. Tamar and Spey will stay in the Indo-Pacific and be joined by Type 31 frigates in the future. 
to reinforce our increased forward presence, we are going to place at its heart our world-class commando forces. The IR has endorsed the future commando force, an exciting and bold new concept that blends special operations capable troops with cutting edge battlefield technology. And we can innovate and adapt at the pace of relevance because of the ambition, caliber, and intelligence of our people. As an example, over 10% of our most junior Royal Marines have honors degrees, whilst 40% are educationally qualified to be officers. And commandos provide nearly 50% of all UK badged special forces. That's a striking proportion from a force that makes up just under 4% of all UK armed forces. And across the entire Royal Navy, we are devouring novel technologies and innovation, but we have much, much more to do. We've already appointed a chief technology officer. We are upskilling our workforce to be more tech savvy, including secondments and courses with startups that really challenge our ideas and notions of technological acceleration. We intend to apply the mantra of faster, cheaper, and better delivering minimum viable products in six to nine months, not six to nine years. We've invested in our own software house called Nelson, a nemesis as our autonomy and experimentation hub. Hence, uncrewed mine hunters, augmented reality and jetpacks. We will begin to launch drones, drones from HMS Prince of Wales in September and accelerate the transition to a hybrid manned, unmanned air wing. My ambition is that we challenge ourselves to create an air wing for each carrier quickly. So these really are exciting and challenging times. To maintain momentum, it feels entirely appropriate that I can now reveal the names of the new Type 31 Inspiration Class frigates. Her Majesty's ships Active, Bulldog, Campbelltown, Formidable, and Venturer. The names are representative of the Royal Navy's future vision. HMS Active reflects the forward deployment of Royal Navy ships to protect UK values and interests. HMS Bulldog recalls our dogged heritage in the North Atlantic. HMS Campbelltown characterizes the pride we have in our future commando force and their specialist raiding role. HMS Formidable speaks for herself and for a fine carrier tradition. And HMS Venturer reflects the Royal Navy's buccaneering technological and innovation instinct. These are ships which will serve for decades to come with names which, which we trust will inspire our people and our nation. So this is a demanding, stimulating time for defense and to be serving in the Royal Navy. We need to deliver on the integrated review and justify the investment being made. Ensuring the security of the UK and its interests and deterring aggressive and adventurous states are our bread and butter. But we also have a role to play in supporting and growing prosperity after the economic challenges of the COVID pandemic. Navies follow trade and trade follows navies. Rules matter, alliances matter, shared values matter. We are a Royal Navy that is flying the flag for global Britain and carrying forward the prime minister's vision of what this country can achieve on the global stage. We will be, as the Prime Minister has envisioned, the foremost naval power in Europe and more, a global Navy for global Britain. Thank you. Uh, Sea Lord, thank you very much for that address. And we already have a, a number of questions uh, addressed uh, to you. And even I have one. Before we go to that, though, uh, you mentioned uh, Commodore Steve Morehouse. We haven't geolocated him exactly, but I think he is somewhere off the corner stroke. Commander of the UK Carrier Strike Group, we, I think, have a message directly from you 
now. First Sea Lord, Admirals, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I speak from uh, HMS Queen Elizabeth, a Royal Navy carrier at sea uh, with fifth generation aircraft, ships, submarines uh, from three NATO nations. And over my shoulder, you'll see the view out of our porthole, so to speak, as we rendezvous with our sister ship HMS Prince of Wales and a Commodore desperately praying that the Wi-Fi system holds for this presentation. Uh, let's just pause and consider those first few facts at least. Since the carrier concepts in the mid to late 1990s, uh, this project has endured six general elections, five SDSRs, six prime ministers, 13 defense secretaries, and nine first sea lords. It's been a long and very winding road, and I think it's safe to say touch and go on more than a few occasions. And yet here we are, ready to deploy next week on seven and a half month deployment as the literal and figurative flagship of global Britain. The Navy set out its objective some time ago. It's stuck to its guns and it's very much seen it through. And it's very much a triumph of strategic national ambition and a testament to all those across government, industry and defence who've made it happen. But for you, what does it mean at the operational level? How does it look when viewed from the bridge? Or to coin a phrase from Nick Robinson when he was on board last week, how does it look from the balcony? Well, as you know, we've only just reached initial operating capability. We still have some way to go. But our experience over the last fortnight or so in Exercise Strike Warrior is a mile apart from where we were last October when we sailed as a strike group. And with the start of CSG 21, we have reached an inflection point. For the last 10 years, the Royal Navy has been asking government and allies for support, be that financial, political or technical. But from this point onwards, the Royal Navy starts to repay on that investment and we will be offering political and military choice. And that's what Carrier Strike Group 21 will deliver. There is huge interest from other government departments, embassies and high commissions to support their military, political, diplomatic and economic objectives across three oceans and in excess of 40 countries that we'll visit. Sakure visited last October and was excited by what he saw. And in a few days time, we'll be hosting Secretary General, the Chairman of the Military Committee, and another raft of senior NATO officials. Shortly thereafter, I will be attaching two units to proceed to the Black Sea to conduct operations with partners and allies, while another escort will depart to the Adriatic before pushing on to the Red Sea to operate with our Middle Eastern partners. And that's before the Queen Elizabeth Group has actually entered the region. So a renewed Royal Navy presence eastward certainly doesn't come at the expense of our existing commitments CSG 21 will do both. My second point is about the UK and United States cooperation. As you will all be aware, Queen Elizabeth is operating a mixed air group, a squadron of UK F-35Bs and a squadron from the United States Marine Corps. Now I'm routinely asked by journalists whether this in some way embarrasses me. And my answer is an unequivocal, absolutely not. Those who simply cannot see beyond pure numbers really do miss the point. For two nations such as ourselves to operate fifth generation aircraft from the same deck at the same time is a huge strategic advantage. And I think the biggest compliment that we can give ourselves is that the United States are comfortable with the UK carrier strike group commanding the largest fifth generation air wing afloat anywhere in the world today. And this could not have been possible without the absolutely fantastic support from our US partners and indeed the Marine Nationale. But we should be alive to the fact that the US Navy is not without its own burdens. They too have to balance the Europe and Middle East with all that they see in the Indo-Pacific. So we should not overlook the importance of this deployment to them or underestimate what we have to offer. And my third and final point is about the growing and untapped potential of these ships. We've only just been 
begin to see the first green shoots and glimpses of what the Secretary of State for Defence would call the convening power of the Queen Elizabeth class. The US Navy has wonderfully contributed USS the Sullivans, a state-of-the-art Arleigh Burke destroyer. And without wishing to underplay that at all, the Dutch frigate Everson represents a far larger proportional contribution from the Royal Netherlands Navy. Carrier Strike has the power to bring together like-minded navies and air forces for that matter, of all sizes in NATO and beyond. From NATO to the Five Power Defence Agreement, from New Zealand and Australia to India and the GCC, the numbers of countries, alliances, frameworks and coalitions seeking engagement with the carrier group is growing on a daily basis. And it's not just the carrier. The F-35B model is proving hugely attractive. Many of you will see that the Italian Navy has just completed their first deck qualifications on their carrier, the Cavour. And Japan, Korea and Singapore have all signaled their intent to operate F-35Bs at sea from large decks. So as the F-35B community grows, we need to work together, support one another, and most importantly, learn together. So in conclusion, as we sailed from Portsmouth a few weeks ago, there were one or two goosebumps on this old sailor. As we passed Round Tower and South Sea came into view, the crowds were six or seven deep along the seafront, pleasure craft following us out to Nab Tower, and many of us had a little grit in the eye as we saw the response to our departure. And for me, this deployment has a, a wonderful, pleasing symmetry. Ocean Wave in 1997 was my first deployment as a young lieutenant uh, as an a and an aviator. But what of the next generation and my successors? What do they make of it all? Well, a few days ago, we had our first no-fly day, and it was the opportunity for many to operate on the upper deck for the first time since we'd sailed. So as well as enjoying the inevitable bit of vitamin D, it was a chance to see what all the fuss was about. Most of them had certainly heard the jets arrive. It's impossible almost to avoid it, even six or seven decks below the flight deck. But this was their first opportunity to see the aircraft and the deck up close. From the moment that they'd arrived and entered the doors of Raleigh, Dartmouth and Cranwell, their entire careers and training had been shaped by the preparations for this deployment. And there they were on the flight deck four and a half acres of fifth generation aircraft carrier. The sun was shining, the ensign was flying at the mainmast, and they were part of it, ready to be gun. And the brochure really was living up to the reality. They are young, incredibly young, but my goodness, they are impressive. They are skilled, they are committed, and they are hugely excited for what lies in store on this deployment and well beyond. They all have an incredible amount to learn still, but so do I for that matter. Indeed, we all have a lot to learn. But my parting comments are to be in no doubt whatsoever, a new era of British maritime power has begun. Thank you very much indeed. Commodore Steve Morehouse, thank you um, very much for that presentation with, which came through to us uh, loud, clearly and uh, powerfully. Uh, and I know many people um, in this room uh, were jealous uh, of the room you had and the view you uh, had outside of your room. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. We now move to uh, the question and answer period, which will run till 11 uh, a.m. And I want to ask um, the first sea lord perhaps um, the first question in case this subject uh, might not otherwise uh, be addressed during the day. Um, and that is that, of course, another important role that the Royal uh, Navy performs is the maintenance of a uh, continuous at sea uh, deterrent. And um, when um, the IR Defense Command paper and all of that was presented, there was you know, some talk about uh, the number of uh, nuclear warheads that would now be minimally maintained. At the IISS, you know, we follow nuclear issues very uh, carefully and we noted 260 warheads. We did a little bit of pretty simple math, 16 times eight times two gets you to 256. Is that a good answer to the question as to why 260? So, uh, so thank you, John. I think um, 
I think the importance of the IR and its statement around a nuclear deterrent for us is its affirmation of the existing policy. And I also think it's recognition that we have been a successful, responsible nuclear power. And I think for all of us of our age, when we were growing up, the, the horror, the expectation that the world would suffer nuclear proliferation has been contained, and it's been contained by you know, ourselves and others being responsible nuclear powers. And that has meant that some other countries have not had to go down the nuclear route because they have the assurance, such as the, you know, our partners within NATO, that we provide a nuclear deterrent to NATO. So I think that's the, that to me is the big backdrop of what was said in the IR. And then on the detail piece, I, I think we also have to be really careful. Our policy remains the same, that we will provide a minimum and credible nuclear deterrent. And there were some of us saying that the, the trouble with a super transparent approach is the risk that that deterrent becomes less credible. So we're also being open that we want to be a little bit more ambiguous in terms of the detail that we provide and, and, and then just stick behind a minimum and credible deterrent and we will continue to be a responsible nuclear power. And I think the government has, has had deliberations and to me this is affirmation of what we provided to the nation and we should be very proud of our success as being a responsible nuclear power. Thank you very much. And from the room uh, here, uh, we have two questions. First, uh, was it Hugo Dissi or, yeah. With such uh, analyst here at the IISS, please. Thank you. Uh, what strikes me with the CSD-21 deployment is that the UK stands ready to create a precedent for a conventional aircraft carrier operating east of Singapore. Doesn't that risk creating expectations that the Royal Navy will then struggle to meet in the future, given that tensions are also rising in other regions, and with them, the Royal Navy uh, responsibilities to keep Europe secure? So I, 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 must, I don't see it the same way. Um, this is an inaugural deployment. Uh, it, it, it matches the integrated review that we're going out into the world. We're demonstrating a new capability. We're trying to demonstrate our confidence, the way that we approach the world. We're linking it with our trade, our security aspirations, our being close to our allies and partners. It, it, it's exactly as, as, as it says on the tin in terms of what we're looking to do. The piece to me, uh, as yeah, particularly as a sailor, on this, this over-analysis of, like, if you go there, you're going to stay. There's, there's a it's a really simple comment that ships float and move. And, and the, if, you, if we're in Japan, if you look at Japan and, and the distance to get to the Middle East, or if you go from Portsmouth to the Middle East, it takes you about the same time. And so this, this, I think we've got to get into the habit of these are dynamic, flexible, deployable forces. So we go off, we go off to the, to, to the Indo-Pacific, we come back at, at, for, the, for the majority of its time, we will be looking to provide a carrier to NATO and fulfilling our Euro-Atlantic responsibilities. <laughs> and then there'll be times rather like we, we do with existing forces where we will operate beyond the normal NATO boundary, but we'll do that deliberately and we'll look at what are our strategic and operational objectives and, and, and why do we want to do that? And what are the intelligence, what does the intelligence picture look like as to whether or not are you going to be in the wrong place at the wrong time? But fundamentally, we've got to remember that ships move and float and that that allows you to position them and then you adjust it. And the piece that I would also say is um, the one thing that's for sure is that the, the carrier deployment that we're embarking on will have twists and turns literally over the next seven to eight months because events will happen. And, and what we're really offering our politicians is choice. It's choice to be able to respond to the world as we know it. So I, 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 I just don't see it in, in quite so dramatic a way um, that, that, that you outline with your question. Thank you very much. And uh, formerly of Defence uh, Intelligence in the MOD, but now uh, happily with IISS, Paul Wimmer. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for Cecil for your, your address. 
I, I'm struck by the fact that the question of availability has already come up twice this morning. Um, and that's, you know, there's, there's long been a, a sort of friction between the, the number of holes on paper and the number available for operations. The Secretary of State clearly put down a marker that he expects greater availability of holes in the future. And you were quite confident about your ability to, to do that in, in this decade. Could you just bring that out a little bit more? Say, you know, how, what makes you so confident that you can achieve that? Yes, um, absolutely. So, in a way, the, the backdrop of availability is because we are so much in demand. You know, we, we, we have a government that wants to deploy ships and submarines be out there in the world and they i think they buy into and we've got a cheaper defense staff you know we have a, a, a i think we've got a, a security architecture that, that that values what the maritime can offer in terms of fulfilling objectives so that's that's the that's deeply reassuring for for, for, for me as first seaward so you then have okay well the, 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 there are some frustrations with that uh, demand which and, and, and if you look at the, um, the basics of capital investment, and some of our ships are, are, are reasonably old, and therefore it's really hard work to keep them going to provide the availability um, that, that we think we should get out of them. And then if you look ahead, we have this amazing uh, cap yeah, capital injection in, into the maritime sector. That's why they see yeah, seven or eight um, classes of ships and submarines over the next decade that hasn't been seen for nearly 50 years. Our growth in tonnage is on the back of uh, the aircraft carriers and some of our larger support ships, larger destroyers, larger frigates uh, and, and, and larger submarines. But the other piece that goes with that is we see with our smaller ships that they're, they're available to be uh, at sea for over 320 days a year. And at the moment, for the majority of our frigate and destroy, destroyer fleet, is that it, we have an availability of about 60% and about 80, 85% for our smaller uh, ships. When you then look to how do we unlock the opportunities that come with that capital investment? And, and one of the ways to unlock it is that we're going to have to change our people, our, our people model. And that's why we're talking about having double crewing with ships or reflecting better the way that we crew our smaller ships so that you can then have the ships permanently deployed and you can have them available for operations. And that's then when I go into my transformation program. How do we shift the Navy to be able to leverage off that capital investment and, and have far more available for operations? And, 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 and it, it's, it's really, it's almost, it's as simple as that. That's why we're shifting the Navy. HMS Montrose is, the, is, is one of our oldest Type 23s, but it's the one that has been the most available for operations because it's permanently deployed. It's got great maintenance facilities uh, that, we, we, that we use in the Middle East, and it's got two crews. And, and, and so we're, we're adopting those models. But if you combine that with the capital investment and new ships, and that's what I mean about the challenge to, 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 to the fleet commander. It's an amazing position to be able to say in 2030, when you look at the growth from 19 frigates and destroyers to 2040 in the early 2030s, with that increase of availability from 60 to 80%, you start to give twice the number of days in terms of our escorts, and that becomes really meaningful. And to those, those other questions about, well, how are you going to do a bit more well, it's, it is a kind of do the maths. Um, we, it, it all works out. Many thanks. And here's a, a maths question from uh, James Waller. And everybody, the money question had to be asked. First, Sea Lord, a very uplifting uh, speech on the future. But the National Audit Office has identified a multi billion funding gap in long term procurement plans. A proposed budget uplift is not enough to cover this significant gap, he says. What cuts to output programs and capabilities does he expect? to have to make in the short and medium term in order to keep inside his budget and to resolve this particular black hole? So I think, uh, again, I think the, the integrated review and the uh, Defence Command paper was pretty honest in the sense of, it recognised the uplift in terms of the money being invested in defence, that, that, that plus 24 billion. 
almost as significant to, to, to us as practitioners was the fact that, that we've got a four year budget and that, then that penciled in budget for the next 10 years. Because the, the notion, uh, I think for all of us as chiefs, but, but, but you know, as first sea lord, running a, a seven billion pound organization with 30 odd thousand people and that has these long-term capital programs and running that on one year at a time budgets is really tough. So, so as well as the additional investment, um, there's this importance of that we've got this four year assuredness. Um, and I think that's very significant when that has been done against the backdrop of economic uncertainty in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah, the, the, yeah, that, that really is um, a government that is investing in defense. But we also said, as ever, when you take that additional investment and you look at our ambition, well, actually, there has to be some, uh, some give and take. So there are some adjustments across the whole of defense. And, and you've seen those in terms of some of the savings and with the Army, with the Air Force and with the Navy. With the Navy, they're relatively modest. So we come down a couple of frigates for a few years and then we latch onto the um, uh, capital investment program. We are making adjustments with technology. So we don't need as many people when we, when we switch from mine hunting ships to uh, mine hunting drones. And then, and then the, 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 the core question of, well, does this beautifully balance the equipment plan? Well, we, we now are going through that work to then say, uh, and if you, if you, if you choose the, 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 the Levine model, the onus is back on us as chiefs. What can I do with a more assured budget when I look out over the next 10 years with a shipbuilding pipeline, which, which comes down to me, and the Secretary of State has been really clear, that is the money. Now work with industry because you're not getting more money. If you get it right, you might be able to get more ships. If, you're, if you get it wrong, you're going to have fewer ships and you're going to have less capability. Now, those are the decisions, those are the conversations that we're now having, but you can have those because we've got that assuredness and the, the resources better match the strategy. We then have to work that through to then see whether or not does it beautifully balance all the way through the equipment plan. And, but the, the, I, and I, don't think it, I don't think it ever will beautifully balance, by the way. I think there will be some elements where the, 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 there will be gaps and, and we'll have to say, right, we're going to wait to see whether or not we can find a better way of addressing that gap and it could again be technology, it could be that we have to uh, restrict our ambition, it might be that we play with time, or it might be that actually we find a better way that we can provide what we want to provide uh, because we've got a better solution. But I, I, we're in a much, much better position than we've been, than, than I've known in, in, in the sort of recent uh, 20 years or so. Um, and, and the onus is coming on us as service chiefs to then say, right, what does it look like? So it's a long answer to say, we, we, it's, it, it shifted from the position that's been reported and now we've got to do more work to then try and see, right, can we even better balance the position that we've got? Um, but I don't think we'll ever get to the, this all looks like a red carpet, do you mind trotting down it? Uh, there'll be risk involved and there'll be some iterations as we go through. Many thanks. And this question from our uh, senior fellow for land warfare, uh, Brigadier retired uh, Ben Barry, uh, Simple, straightforward question. The Army has a brigade for information operations and is forming a new security force assistance brigade. Do we see similar capabilities in the Royal Navy? We do, but I also think, um, and ben, ben, ben will know this better than me, that this 7-7 brigade uh, is, 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 it has to be a defense entity. Um, we've got, We've got 30 commando, um, which is an amazing capability. But my, you know, one of my frustrations is that's a capability that outstrips uh, our Royal Marines and it has to infuse the whole of the Royal Navy. And then I think there's an even bigger conversation that some of these capabilities have to be fused together and, and apportioned by defense. So we're growing um, yeah, the, the, the real impact uh, of uh, our information operations uh, piece is around the connectedness as we introduce the new capabilities. The F-35 is a phenomenal capability 
Um, there's some, I think we've, you know, when we talk about fifth generation aircraft, I think some people think it sort of goes faster and it can, and it can take the corners uh, more, more quickly. It, 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 it is so much more than that. And, and, and being able to share that information around the force and do that at a defense level, um, those, those are some of the things that we have to do. I'm, I'm wary of this. Like, what we need to do now is, is, is create this structure uh, and, uh, and, and then that makes it, that gives us a reassurance that actually, um, we're, we, yeah, I'm not going to produce a squadron of information uh, ships. I want a whole fleet of uh, information ships because that's what we do on a daily basis and we've got to get better at it. So I don't think, uh, to Ben, you're, um, we're investing in that area. Uh, we're doing it at a, um, at a new level because we're linking in to a much greater degree with our land forces and with our air forces, and then it links in better to the digital backbone and can we operate better in space and so on. So my answer is that uh, we're driving down the, the networks and that investment that's happening to join us all together. I don't think that, and leveraging what we've already got, I don't think that it will, it will be stylized in the way that the army has. And that's not a criticism of the army, I think it's just a reflection of these slightly different environments. And we're very purple here at the ISS. So the next question is from our senior fellow for air power, uh, Douglas Barry. What would you envisage a crude uninhabited air wing for each of the two aircraft carriers would consist of in numerical terms, a squadron each of F-35Bs with what mix and type of UAVs and UCAVs? So I, I, the only, I don't know, I, 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 and I'm really wary uh, of, of saying, oh, guess what, it's gonna look like this. All that I'm saying is it feels, and I think um, Mike Wigston Kaz um, is, 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 is really clear on this. In terms of a direction, I think it seems inevitable that we will be merging crude um, fighters uh, and aircraft and helicopters with drones. And that feels like that that's, and that's not very far off. So that's why we have this ambition to, um, to start to, fly, to, to show that we can fly drones off of HMS Prince of Wales. I think the likelihood then is that, yeah, if you take, you take the sort of loyal wingman type approach of merging drones with F-35s with other aircraft, that feels that that's, uh, that's right. You then have this notion of the F-35 as the quarterback and doing that directing and, 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 a, and a, an increased proliferation of drones. And then does that then clear up the battle space for your mass of the fourth generation to, to, to come through and operate uh, much more effectively. With, I think those, that's, that's how it looks to us. And then we've got to carry on the technological journey of saying, right, where are we? How quickly can we introduce this? What then might be the balance and the mix? Uh, and what does that start to look like? But it, it, it feels that that's the direction in a technological sense. And then the other aspect is, 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 let's be honest, there's a, sheer, um, there's a sheer straightforward economics of this. The, the drones that we're talking about are sophisticated drones and they cost about five or 10% of the cost of, of, of some of our uh, piloted aircraft. And that's what's driving, well actually, when you look at your capital expenditure over the next 10 years or so, well, what, what's the best balance of those opportunities to deliver the effects that we're after. Um, so I, I, that, I, I'm trying to be as honest as possible to sort of, to offer you a view as to what direction, what's the shape, where do we think we're going and what's the thinking behind this. But I don't want to, uh, I don't want to start saying, well, actually it's gonna be 25% uh, piloted and 75% drones and so on, because we, because we don't know. And I think we'll have to take the final question now from John Binns, uh, Sydney Sussex College, uh, Cambridge, there's an emphasis on naval presence, but considering that even in an ideal world, there will never be enough hulls, do you think that naval personnel in a diplomacy role could provide some of the global presence required? So I think we already do. Um, I think that, um, and I think we do that ashore and at sea, but I also, the other piece that I think goes with um, the hull issue is this amazing multilateralism. So we're part, and, and the ease with which you can bring other um, maritime forces together. So that's what you're seeing with the carrier group. 
that's what you're seeing with uh, a littoral response group that's operating in Northern Europe at the moment with our Jeff partners. An amazing relationship that we have with France uh, through the CJEF. The, uh, the amazing uh, contribution that we can make to the FPDA. The links that, that, that I, you know, we, we all have as Navy chiefs, whether, the, the, you know, America, France, Denmark, um, Holland. When I go further east, our relationship with India, Japan, Australia, South Korea, and the ease at which we're, we operate together, that's, that's how you magnify our, uh, our, our influence. And then the piece that's exciting for me with those nations is, that, is our shared values and interests. And that that's the bit that allows us to, to conjoin and take advantage of like-minded nations and project our views on, on, on the world to support each other's uh, aspirations, to support our trade, our prosperity agendas, um, and, and get into that space. Uh, and that, that feels that that's something that we've done in the past. It feels very alive now. Um, and that's something that we're looking to harness in the future. So I'd, I'd see it as less, less in the, um, let's get down to that level. I think it's more come up and see the opportunities to work with like-minded nations and to do it from a maritime angle and how that supports the government's objectives. Well, thank you very much, Firstly Lord. I think that's exactly the right way to conclude this morning uh, session full of uh, keynote uh, addresses. Uh, what a great way to start with uh, Ben Wallace, um, First Sea Lord and Commodore Steve Morehouse. We hope that you are still uh, with us and good luck for your 28 weeks of uh, travel uh, throughout the maritime uh, domain. Uh, we reconvene in 15 minutes, 11.15, so that's true for the 303 people that are online as well. For those of us in this room, we have the privilege of an actual uh, coffee break, but could we all join hands in the usual way to thank all of our speakers this morning. Thank you very much.